we're going to be talking about a psychological phenomenon known as the audience effect. And this is going to be deeply related to the other psychological phenomenon we've discussed called the diffusion of responsibility. The idea that groups will eliminate the sense of culpability of responsibility an individual feels. Before we can go there, there's two key points that we got to address. You may know it from my work, you may know it from elsewhere. The first is that we all have reflexes, we are evolutionarily hardwired to survive. These reflexes are, in the words of uh, Lawrence Gonzalez, what served the majority of our species in the majority of circumstances the majority of the time. They are not always necessarily the best response now in your given circumstance. However, they will come out. If we encounter stress and we are not able to cognitively process a response, what Joseph Ledoux termed a high road response, then our subconscious, reflexive, autonomic system will take over. An example is something like dust in the eye is too fast for us to have any cognitive response. So our reflexive system takes over and we blink. Choking, same thing, boom. The esophagus closes off to protect us. Other things have slightly longer thresholds like a punch coming in. If I don't see it, if I don't have enough time, if my reactionary gap is not sufficient, then my hands will flinch. If I have a little bit more time, then my training can kick in, providing my training is sufficient. So we are all governed by our reflexes. Ideally, they should be enhanced, guided, and supported by effective training. And so it is that I say, we do not rise to the occasion. We do not magically become better under stress, but rather we fall to the level of our training. So that's the first thing to understand. The second essential thing that we need to know before going forward is that in motor performance, there is something known as a zone of optimal performance or optimal arousal. This is the idea that elite performers consistently function best in the middle of the arousal state. Neither completely flaccid and zoned out in a zen state, nor completely jacked up and excited in a rage state. Rather, they get into that, that place where it's like they're just inhaling solid matter. They feel like they're breathing fire. They have enough cortisol and adrenaline and stress cocktail to look around the room, have more strength, have more acuity, to have a bit more resistance to pain, more second wind, more drive, more all of that. They are losing some fine motor control, maybe a little bit of um, affected perception. There's a bit of tunneling and hyperfocus, but it is minimal, negligible in comparison to the relative gain. They go too much further into arousal, then they start to get erosion, gross motor, they start to lose too much, lose the fine motor, lose cognition, and then it's diminishing returns. That is the zone of optimal arousal or optimal performance. Now why this is important is that if I have a skill that is not deeply trained and embedded in my system, then it is very, very difficult, if not impossible, for me to achieve a zone of optimal performance. Let's take these verbal skills that we're discussing. If they are poorly trained and I get into a stress state and I'm trying to use them and I need to cognitively remember, okay, always say this, never say this, and I'm focusing on that, my attention resources are being maxed out like circuits that are ready to overload. If you add anything else on top of that, like consideration of the fact that people are watching me and I might make a mistake, I'm gonna blow a fuse. By comparison, if I'm an elite performer, if I've mastered these verbal skills, I have a black belt in verbality, and I'm talking really well, and I go, okay, this is what I know, yeah, I've trained for this, I might be stressed, I might be nervous, I might be self-aware, but then I'll be able to use the audience, the spectators, to my advantage. This is why consistently an elite performer, take for example an Olympian, will get charged by the power of the crowd. And they'll later say, man, I, you know, I, I kind of hulked out and I took extra energy from them. It's because they were masterful at the primary skill, running, basketball, whatever it was they were doing. So they were able to focus on the crowd and channel it. If by comparison they weren't, or worse still, they weren't masterful at basketball, they were playing Michael Jordan in his prime, and now there's a crowd. Now they're thinking of the crowd, and the crowd is reinforcing the reality that they're going to make a mistake, and it becomes too much for them. So there will be something termed an audience effect. That is the power of an audience to elicit what is often called social facilitation. And social facilitation is kind of like a lubricant. It's kind of like an energy. It's that power from the crowd. 
If I'm terrified and I'm uncertain about verbal de-escalation, then I'm going to be thinking about the verbal de-skills while looking around at the crowd and I'm going to be fidgeting and nervous. By comparison, my aggressor might be pretty familiar with it. Right? Am I right, guys? Right? Is this guy a jackass or what? He's doing that whole grandiose thing. He's showboating to the crowd because he doesn't need to think about being an aggressive douche, so he thinks about the crowd bringing him power. The crowd gives him power. The crowd responds. And because of the principle of social diffusion, right, of, of uh, responsibility, uh, diffusion of responsibility, you'll have people in the crowd now starting to chant, fuck them up, yeah, doing all that, because they're feeding off of that idiot who is comfortable, yeah, yeah, and they start chanting back and forth, and so it goes. At the worst level, the crowd starts adding kicks and hitting you and doing all that stuff. So that's where we see how social responsibility or diffusion of responsibility can tie in with the audience effect. By comparison, if you are well versed in your verbal skills, you'll now be in a position to be a good cinema courtroom lawyer. And you'll be diffusing with the primary. You may even be looking at the secondary. If the crowd starts to look, you'll, you might even be able to turn to the crowd and say, am I right? Hey, would you mind, ma'am? Could you just move your chair back? Would you do me a favor? Just take that bottle up. And in the middle of a de-escalation, I can address the individuals in the crowd. What this does is it starts to divert responsibility. It starts to shatter that, that diffusion of responsibility. I have been in scenarios where I'm talking and I sense the crowd is becoming mob-like. You know, everybody's moving in with their drinks. I, I, I was a doorman before the days of cell phones, now they would be filming. But at that point, right, I would say things like, excuse me, sir, can you just do me a favor, just take a step back there. What's your name? Hey, okay, Doug, your, uh, your coat is on the floor. Oh, that's not your coat? No problem. But I'd get a name, I'd address people in the crowd, and that would individualize that person and start to break down this diffusion of responsibility. So the very first thing I need to realize about the audience effect is that if I want to make it work in my favor, I need to train my skills. If I don't train my skills, I'm going to be vulnerable in a one-on-one -on -one attack, but I am going to be decimated in a group attack. I am going to be giving that aggressor, who is usually more versed at aggression, the entire power of the crowd to fuel them rather than me. Secondly. I want to do everything I can to funnel attention to me. So if we go back a step to hurting the group, we see that hurting the group now also brings attention onto one spot. Right? If the audience effect is not serving me, sometimes it can. Sometimes the audience will say, come on Tom, stop it man, you're going to get in trouble, stop it. You know, there's a, a, very, a, a lot of examples you'll see of like guys attacking cops on YouTube. And as the cop is even losing and fighting, whatever, you'll see people in the crowd saying, Bill, stop fighting, man, you're gonna go to jail. And they're talking to him as the cop is doing the work, right? That's an example of an audience helping you. But if the audience is not helping you, if they're chanting and doing all this stuff and it's building up momentum, I gotta break that momentum. So I can personalize them and I can dissect, I can recruit from the crowd, ask for questions, get a name, give somebody a task, try to corral a member of the, if the guy's chanting over here, excuse me, you move over here, fuck you, I'm not going to move, all right, no problem. But then I move myself into a position where I can see everybody because I know that person is going to be a problem. I can also try to extract myself. All right, I'll talk about this in a few minutes, guys. I got to get back and try to get out of that dynamic. Or I can try to invite them. All right, look, this is not about them. This is about you and me. Let's go talk about this in the hallway. And I try to encourage those people out. So there are many ways I can break up the audience effect, but what's important is that I'm aware of it. And the most important thing is that it gives me extra motivation to refine my skills. Because if I am not well versed, if I cannot get a zone of optimal performance and get my performance high in that state, and if I need to think about the verbal and physical skills I'm using, then I'm going to be overloaded when I have to have awareness of the crowd. I don't have that much resource available for focus. But if I'm just kind of autonomic and natural, and I have those skills coming out naturally, I'm talking, I'm churning, my hands are up, I don't need to think about it, I'm doing the best I can verbally, now I can think about the crowd, and the crowd can serve me.